Hey there, Touch Designer Developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're gonna walk through building a super simple step sequencer within Touch Designer for a drum machine VST. So we're gonna use this opportunity to kind of show you how you can start to utilize VSTs in Touch Designer now that they've been added to the experimental version. And we're gonna do so by building this step sequencer. So if you haven't used a step sequencer before, it allows you to kind of define the points within a pattern that particular instruments, in this case of a drum set, will be triggered. So, so it's a super visual way to kind of build rhythmic patterns. Um, and in this case, you have a number of switches which you can turn on and off to trigger that particular instrument at a particular point in time. So it's a super cool and intuitive tool to start building these rhythmic patterns with and a lot of fun to put together. So with that, let's jump right in to building this. Okay, so before we get into building this within Touch Designer, the first thing that I wanted to point out is that you're going to need to install the plugin that we looked at in the beginning of this video. Uh, so I've actually done a write-up on this for the Interactive and Immersive HQ blog. So head over to the Interactive and Immersive uh, HQ website, which the link will be in the description below. Head to the blog uh, post called How to Install VSTs for Touch Designer. And if you scroll way down, there are walkthroughs for Mac and PC. And once you've got that set up, then we can actually meet back in Touch Designer and get to work. So I'm just gonna go ahead and close out of that now. We can start off with a blank network. So the first thing that we're gonna to do today is bring the audio VST chop into the network. So this is a good point to point out that you are going to need to download the experimental version of Touch uh, if you haven't done so already, because of course this VST doesn't exist in the current stable release. So anyways, once you've got the audio VST added to the network, it is currently pointing to a plugin folder, but not a plugin. And so we have to basically specify the plugin that we're looking for by hitting the plus button. Now, if you have installed Bucket Pops, which again is that drum machine we looked at at the beginning, um, if we click this plus, it should appear in the folder uh, finder or uh, file explorer on Windows window that pops up. Um, we'll just click the file here called bucketpops.vst3 and hit open. Once you do that, you should see a number of different channels. And then if we hit the display plugin GUI button, you can then take a look at the plugin GUI. So um, this is just a super simple uh, drum machine plugin that's emulating a Korg drum machine from the 1960s. It's kind of set up to be used as a um, kind of like backing instrument. So it's got a number of pre-made uh, pre patterns that you can use. We're just gonna trigger it though with MIDI independently of that. Um, so we don't really need to worry too much about this. However, if you do want to kind of get a sense for what the um, different instruments that you can trigger are and the particular MIDI notes for each one of those, we can head to the settings page where you can see we've got note assignments at the bottom and then a number of other things we can tweak about the way that those uh, particular instruments sound and their panning and level and all kinds of fun stuff. We're not really going to deal with any of that in this video, but you know, if you want to kind of tweak this to your own liking, you're free to do so. So anyways, now that we've got that done and loaded correctly, let's also attach an audio device out top so that you can hear the audio um, on your own machine. And here you'll just want to set whatever uh, your default sound card is to hear this. Um, I'm just going to set mine to my particular audio device. And with that, if we were then to come back into the GUI and turn on one of those patterns for whatever reason, we should be able to hear that out of the speakers now. So cool, I'm just gonna turn that back off and we can actually get into building the sequencer. So we're gonna kind of, in the center portion of the network, that's where we'll build out the core sequencer functionality. So I'm gonna move this over to the right and then we're actually going to use a beat chop as the kind of core driver of this sequencer. So if you haven't worked with the beat chop before, it's a super cool chop that 
as we can see in the description, generates a variety of ramps, pulses, and counters that are timed to the beats per minute and the sync produced by the beat dialog or beat command. So basically you can get a number of different um, types of output from the beat shop that are all synchronized to the, or can be synchronized to the global kind of tempo within Touch Designer. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do now. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is um, set our kind of global tempo to something that we want. So I'm just gonna leave mine at 120. And again, that's down in the bottom left corner. You can make it faster, you can make it slower, whatever you want for your particular style of music that you're trying to make. Um, then we will come over to the multiples uh, parameter within the parameter window and set that to 16. What that will do is give us 16 different channels, which in a moment are going to correspond with each one of those 16 steps that we saw at the beginning. So once we've got that set up, we'll then come to the output page. And we actually don't want ramps for these channels, but instead we want pulse. So we're gonna turn pulse on and then we should see sequentially, this will kind of pulse each one of the 16 channels one after the next. So basically these are our 16 steps. And what we're going to do is basically route these to each one of the independent um, pieces of the drum kit. So by selecting, you know, say one, four, and seven, and sending those to the kick, the kick will trigger on step number one, four, and seven. It'll make more sense once we start to build the user interface uh, if you're not quite following, but um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty straightforward way of building this. Um, so let's move on by adding a math chop. We're going to use this math chop for the use case when we actually shut off our um, beat chop from kind of outputting. So you might have noticed in our UI we had an on off switch and what that will do is turn this reset toggle on and off. However, when we reset our beat chop, you'll notice that all of our output channels go to a value of one. And basically what that uh, causes in our VST's output is that our three different instruments that we're going to be triggering, the kick, the hat, and the snare, will all trigger together when we turn it off, which you know isn't that ideal of a situation if you say we're trying to use this for performance or something like that. So we're gonna use this math chop to kind of gate that output in this particular scenario. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're going to then middle mouse click on the output of the audio VST. We're gonna add a logic chop and place that below. And then we're going to use the combined channels and setting. And that means if we have more than one channel on at a time, we'll get a value of one, which we can then use to basically gate our output in that situation. So let's do that now. So the way that we can do this is we'll head to the math chop again. We'll go to the multiply add page and we're going to make a chop reference from this logic chop. So I'm just gonna click and drag over to the multiply parameter, hit chop reference, and then what we'll notice here, if we then hook up a null, nothing will have happened yet. So we're still getting that pulse uh, or that situation where all the channels are on when we have this reset switch on. So what we can then do is we can modify that expression slightly. So if we then add a one minus before this operator or uh, this chop reference expression, and then we hit enter, then it'll multiply by zero when our uh, reset switch is turned on. And that basically means that then we won't send that value of one out when we turn the switch on. So now if we turn it off, we should see that we get those pulse values through. And then when we turn the reset switch back on, we should see that we get a value of zero. So no more accidental or uh, unintended triggering of our drum machine before uh, or when we're trying to turn off our sequencer. Cool, so we're going to then move on to a rename chop to rename these channels. I want to call these something different than pulse because Again, these are like the individual steps for our step sequencer. So something like step makes more sense to me. What we're going to do here is in the from parameter, we're going to type in pulse before the asterisk, and that's gonna grab all the channels using pattern matching that have the word pulse 
in the uh, beginning. We'll then in the to parameter type in step asterisk and that will accomplish renaming all of those pulse channels to step with the number of the channel after step. Cool, so now we're going to build three different branches which are going to correspond to the kick, the snare, and the hat. And we'll kind of build the one for the kick first and then just copy and paste it because it's going to be identical for each one of the three. So what I'm going to do is right click on the output, grab a select chop. I'm going to rename this one to select kick um, to denote that this is the kick branch of the network that we're working on. And then from there, um, I guess we can select arbitrarily a couple of steps. Um, oh, not rename. So that when we start to trigger this, we can, you know, not be triggering a kick on every 16th note that we are generating. So what I want to do here is grab, I'll grab the first channel and maybe the sixth channel and the 10th channel. Um, now that we've done that, let's grab a math chop. Now you'll notice that when we do that, we have multiple channels that are all, if we then actually turn on the beat chop by turning our reset switch off, there we go. We have a couple of different channels that are all triggering at different times. What we want instead is to have one channel that kind of collects these independent steps into a single chop channel to then trigger that um, drum or that kick drum. So what we're going to do within our math chop is uh, use the combined channels setting and use the maximum option there. And that'll combine all of those channels together into a single channel, which again will trigger at those particular steps that we have selected. So then we're going to rename our chop channel. We're going to follow a kind of similar um, setup to working with MIDI in Touch Designer where you can use the name of the chop channel to trigger a specific MIDI note event. And in this case, we're gonna use it to name or to specify which note we actually want to trigger. So I'm going to rename this to N36 because I've already kind of done my research and know that our particular uh, Bucket Pops drum machine VST uses the MIDI note number 36 for the kick drum. After that, we're going to hook up one more math chop. Um, oops, I guess we'll leave that null there that I added. We're gonna add a math chop after the rename. And here we are going to change the output range to fall between zero and 127 instead of zero and one. The reason that we're doing that is because MIDI velocity values follow or uh, fall between 0 and 127 by default. And we, if we send a value of 1, that is a very low velocity, which in some cases, depending on the plugin, might output an extremely quiet or even inaudible note. So by giving it the value of 127 in our range there, we'll make sure that we have a note that's going to be firing at full volume. So I'm just going to move those things back to the left a little bit, and we are going to merge this with the other branches at the end. So let's attach the merge chop now. I already know that we're gonna have some additional operators, so I'm gonna kind of scoot the VST stuff off to the right, and then we can copy and paste this branch and work on the one for our snare. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is just rename our select kick operator to select snare. Our math and rename, or our math is going to stay the same. Rename is going to change because we want to specify a different note uh, within our MIDI note numbers. So the snare by default in bucket pops is on note number 38. So I'm just going to rename that channel to 38, uh, N38 that is, and then we can connect the null at the end to our merge. Cool. So we just got one more to do here. We'll copy and paste the snare below. And this one again is going to be for the hi-hat. So I'm going to rename the select to hat. 
we're going to leave math alone. We are going to change our rename to, in this case, to N54. And then we can connect that to our merge. So another thing, just to, again, kind of clarify our channels, we can rename these nulls to null kick, null snare, and null hat. So we know, again, which one of these are triggering which instrument. After that, we can then attach a null. And what we're going to do, finally, before we move on to building our user interface, is use a chop execute dat in order to take these chop channels and turn them into note information and send that to the VST, audio VST chop, that is. Um, so the way that the audio VST chop works, at least at this point in the experimental version, is you have to send your note information via Python. And that's why we're doing it via the chop execute. So I'm going to right click on the output of the null, head to the dat page, and grab the chop execute dat. Now within the chop execute, before we start writing our code, I want to turn the value change switch off, and then I'm going to turn off to on, on, and on to off, on. Then we can actually hit control E or command E on the keyboard and head into our code. So I think the easiest way to do this is probably for me to paste in the finished version of the code. You can then pause the video and copy that down. Cool. So we are basically doing a send note on when the channel goes from off to on. And you can again look up in the derivative wiki um, the audio VST chop um, wiki article to kind of look at the, the way that these function calls are formatted. Basically, we've got a um, MIDI channel with our uh, initial one value. We then have our MIDI note number, which we're doing a little bit of uh, Python to um, basically just remove the end at the beginning and send the note number that we've set up. And then we have a value for the velocity of that note. And with MIDI, you need to send a note on and a note off. Um, and that's why we have these two different lines of code. So again, pause the video here, copy that down, and then we can move on with the network once you've done so. Okay, so assuming that you've got that all copied down, we will make sure to save that and then we can head back to our network. And what should now be happening is that our, um, Bucket Pops VST should be receiving MIDI from our rudimentary sequencer, and you should be hearing something out of your speakers. Now, right now, these are all triggering on exactly the same step, so it's going to sound not super great, but you can always come in and manually add some different steps in just to make sure and hear that those channels are kind of being individually triggered. So I'm just gonna do that and once you've kind of confirmed that that's all working and that your code looks correct, we can then move on to building the user interface. Okay, so moving on to the user interface. The first thing that I'm gonna do actually is just turn the B-chop off so that we don't um, hear output through our building process. Okay, so our user interface, first of all, needs a container. So we're gonna add a container comp to the network and then we're going to modify the width and height of this container to be 850 for the width parameter and 200 for the height. Once we've got that set up, we can head inside where we're going to add an additional set of containers for each one of the rows in our user interface. So I'll begin with another container comp We'll set the width again to 850, and in this case, we're just gonna set the height to 50. Uh, now that we've done that, let's rename it to container space row space on off. So I'm doing that because this is where our on off switch is going to reside. We'll then head inside. I'm going to grab a text comp, first of all, for the label, and then I will also grab a button comp for the button. We'll then come back up to the text comp where I'm going to change the 
layout, uh, the width and the height on the layout page first. And here we're going to set the width and the height to a value of 50. We'll then come to the text page where I'm going to set our label to be on slash off. And then we'll come to the font page and set the font size to 10. Cool. Uh, one final thing I want to do here actually is head back to the layout page and make sure that our align order is set to a value of negative one. And that'll just make sure when we eventually align our different components that this label is the kind of first thing in that order um, and will be on the left side of the screen. So then within our button comp, let's head first to the layout page and make sure to set our height to a value of 50 so that it's a square. And in this case, I'm just gonna change the label to an X. Um, you could change it, I guess, to on off just like the um, label next to it if you wanted to, or you could even just delete the label and have it blank. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'll just actually make it on off in this case. Um, then we will attach a rename chop to the output where I'm going to rename the chop channel to on off as well. And then after that, we're just going to attach a null and finally, an out chop. Cool. So now we're going to kind of reuse this setup for the actual step uh, sequence portions themselves uh, and make a couple of modifications. Before we do that, though, you'll notice that our label and our button are stacked on top of each other. So we need to head to the children page where we'll change our line mode to left to right. Cool, so now we are all set up uh, with our on off row and we can copy and paste this and rename our second container here to kick or container row kick rather. In this case, we're gonna modify the kick container first and then we'll copy and paste it for the snare and the hat just because we're gonna make some additional changes to it. So then we'll head inside um, I think the easiest way to go about this is we'll edit the text first and then we'll add our buttons. So within the text, um, all we need to do is change our text parameter on the text page to kick. Then we'll head to the button comp. So in this case, we're just going to change the name and then we're going to copy and paste it a bunch of times. So we're going to change the, uh, or the label rather, we're gonna change the label to read me.digits and then we'll change the uh, parameter mode to expression. That will grab the uh, digits from the label and ensure that each one of our steps has a number that's associated with the particular step that it's turning on and off. Once we've done that, we can then copy and paste this 16 times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Let's see if I missed one there. Oh, got an extra one, so let's delete that. Make sure you've got 16. And then we're going to come back up top. And before this rename chop, I'm going to insert a merge chop so that we can merge all of these channels together. Then make sure that you click on button one first so that merge is not selected. And then we'll go ahead and right click and select all of those buttons at once and then connect them to the input of the merge. Uh, you'll notice that because the button one was already connected that we're getting, uh, we have a double connection there. So I'm just gonna remove that first connection and now we should have 16 different channels coming in. Cool, so in this case, we're gonna have to modify the um, rename a little bit. Uh, we're going to change our from channel to read V asterisk, so that it pulls in using pattern matching all of the channels with the V at the beginning. And then we'll change the to parameter to step asterisk. Here we're just using this again to make sure that we are clear which steps are on versus off. Um, now that we've done that, we're actually all good to continue on. We can head back up and if we look, we should see our label on the left and our 16 steps appearing in order after that. We can then copy this 
and paste it two times. And in this second uh, one, we'll change this to container row snare. And the third one we'll rename to container row hat. The only thing we then have to do is come inside of the snare um, container and rename our label to snare. And we'll do the same thing for the hat container as well. So let's just do that. Cool, so we've got all of those set up. Now what do we do with those channels? Um, we're going to attach a null to each one of these and then use chop execute dats once again to route this information to the correct location. So I'm going to attach a null, the on to off, and then I guess I can just copy and paste the null and attach that to the second kick and then to the snare and paste another one and attach that to the hat. Now I'll do my due diligence and rename those so that we know what they're doing. So I'm just using the name, same name that we, we uh, used on the container. Cool. Now that we've got that done, uh, let's add chop executes for each one of these and then I'll again show you the code. You can copy it down. And once we've got that all set up, everything should be functional and we should have a step sequencer. So I'm gonna right click on the output of the first null and again, grab a chop execute. Um, in this case, we want, just like our previous chop execute, we're gonna turn value change off. We're gonna turn off to on, on, and on to off, on. Then I will open this in an external code editor and paste in the finished code. Okay, so here is the finished code. It's really simple. All you have to do is um, basically create a reference to the reset switch on our beat chop, which we talked about earlier. Basically, it's just gonna take the on off output or the toggle output of our button and send it to that reset switch. And um, so again, go ahead and just pause the video, copy this down, and when you have finished, make sure that you hit Control S or Command S to save your code. And then we'll head back to the network and create another chop execute for our kick. Okay, cool. So in this case, we are just going to leave our value change switch on. We're not gonna deal with any of the other modes. Then let's go ahead and open that in the external code editor and I'll paste in the final version of the code. Cool, so go ahead and pause the video now and copy down these two lines of code. Once you've got those lines of code copied down, I just wanna point out we're using list comprehension here to grab the particular channels within our chop that have a uh, an evaluated value of one. So basically, if you've turned any of those step switches on, it will collect them into a list, and then we'll send that to the select kick chop, uh, which we had in the network above this one, to grab those particular channels from the beat chop. So it's pretty straightforward, uh, maybe a little bit semi uh, intermediate or advanced Python if you haven't dealt with that before, but um, it's pretty uh, straightforward once you kind of dig into the nuts and bolts of it. So once you've got that copied, uh, make sure to hit Control S or Command S to save your code. And then let's head back to Touch Designer where we'll then, in this case, we'll copy and paste that chop execute. For our third one here, we wanna drag our null snare chop onto the chops parameter and then within the code, which again, we'll open back up. In the second copy, we want to change every reference to kick to, in this case, read uh, snare. So we're just gonna hit Control F and I'm just gonna write kick in the find section and replace that with snare. And then in VS Codium, this is the replace all button. So wherever your replace all button is, hit that and then hit Control S or Command S to save. Cool, we just have to do that one more time for the hat. So we're gonna copy and paste that chop execute. 
I'm going to drag the null hat operator onto the chops parameter. Then we'll open it up in our external code editor. And in this case, I'm going to replace the snare with hat. So I'm going to, within the find parameter, type in snare, and then in the replace parameter, type hat and hit replace all. Cool. So we'll then hit control S to save. And we can actually close out of the code editor. And with that, we should be able to head back up a level and make one final modification and be ready to go. So within the container, you'll see that everything is currently stacked on top of each other. Now, what we actually want to happen is the um, align order of each one of these rows should be set so that they kind of sequentially appear as they did in the original. And that's one thing that we neglected to set up or are going to do now. So let's head back in that container one more time. Um, our first container row, we're going to leave on the layout page the align order to zero because we want that to be the top row. On our kick container, we're going to change the align order to one so that it is the kind of next in line. And then on the snare, we'll do the same thing, head to the layout page, set our align order to two. And then on the hat container, we'll again go to the layout page and set our line order to three. Once we do that, we can then head back up a level. You'll see that they're still stacked on top of each other, and that's because of our children setting. So let's go to our children page. We'll set a line, in this case, top to bottom. And there we should see our on off, kick, snare, and hat rows just as they appeared in the beginning. So before we kind of finish off by testing this, I'm just going to rename this container to container UI, and, or I guess you could say step sequence or whatever you want. Um, and then we'll right click and hit view. Once we've got that up, we should be able to turn this on and see that our beat chop will then start triggering. We should then also be able to select different steps for each one of these instruments and hear these sort of different rhythmic patterns start to emerge. So assuming that all of your code was typed in correctly um, and that all of your operators are kind of in the network as we've shown here in the video, everything should now be functional and you should be able to start generating some cool rhythmic patterns of your own. So obviously, you know, there's way more that we can do with this particular setup. You could make uh, step sequencing channels for each one of the instruments that the um, Bucket Pops VST has available. If you remember, we actually have quite a number of different drums that uh, come with this by default. If you head back to the GUI and head to the settings page, each one of these different um, columns is referencing a different instrument that you can trigger. So you could, you know, keep going with this and make a huge sprawling step sequencer. You could change the number of steps. You could put indicators for what current step we're on. This is just kind of intended to give you, you know, like first steps, getting your feet wet with building a sequencer for a drum machine. And uh, hopefully it has, you know, gotten you to the point where you're comfortable with working with the stuff and can start exploring on your own. So with that, um, that is it for this video. I uh, hope that you've enjoyed putting this together and thank you for watching. Looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.